Well, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Jim Banks always been very close to my heart. I've always felt rather avuncular towards it. Not quite paternal, but you'll see why not paternal in a moment. I first got involved in sequence databases um, as a result of some previous work that I'd done with a database called Rebase, a restriction enzyme database. And so I kind of knew what databases were all about. I was on sabbatical at the MRC lab in Cambridge and got invited back to a meeting at the Rockefeller in 1979 where a number of people were talking about how important it was going to be to set up a, a national sequence database, actually a worldwide sequence database, in which everything could all be in one place, all the sequences could be in one place. And so for anybody who had recently determined a sequence, they would have one place where they could go to find out if their new sequence looked like anything that was already known. And this was obviously a very important thing. And so um, it was a pleasure to come over. I, I also should tell an anecdote at this time that um, I was on sabbatical in Cambridge and I also had to come back for a meeting at New England Biolabs. I was on the scientific advisory board there at the time. I had another meeting at Cold Spring Harbor and a fourth meeting um, somewhere else. And I thought maybe the expenses that I could claim for all of these, if I could get each of these meetings to pay for an economy class airfare, I could actually take Concord to and fro. I discovered it was nothing like enough, and so I missed my, my real chance to fly on Concord. It was the only really good chance I ever had. Now, the Rockefeller meeting was very important because I think what it did, it brought together a whole bunch of people who realized the value of this and who were able to express, eventually to NIH, of how important it was that something like this should be done. Now, it took a little while to get NIH mobilized, and I must say that my recollection of Ruth Kirstein's initial reaction to this was not quite the same as the one that I'd heard previously. In, in fact, Ruth was adamantly opposed to it. And I got myself into some trouble with her uh, because as a, a young Turk who was very keen on seeing all of this done, um, I stood up in a rather public place and said, well, um, she, she was saying she didn't think this was NIH's job to do this. And I said, well, I thought NIH's job was to provide the resources the scientists needed. If science was to advance and needed these resources, NIH should listen to us and they should make the resources available. And of course, eventually they did, uh, but it took a little bit of a fight. Now, <clears throat> as soon as, uh, because, I, I guess because I was a, a little vocal, I've always been a, a little rebellious. As soon as someone tells me I can't do anything, that's always the first thing I want to do. Um, I, I was quite vocal about this and I got drafted onto the committee that was asked to write the request for proposals for GenBank. Um, John Abelson shared that committee. And we wrote the requirements, but we spent a lot of time debating exactly what GenBank should be. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that, because one of the things that we felt very strongly about, and which I think is still really important today, is that GenBank is intended to be an archive in much the way that a library is an archive. If you write a book, um, it goes into the library and you don't expect people to come along changing it all the time. What you want to do is to have a record of what was originally done, in this case, what was originally deposited in the literature. If other people later on want to interpret that and say, well, the interpretation was wrong, then that's fine, but that doesn't belong in the archive. Perhaps a link to some other repository or some other database is okay, but it shouldn't be in the original archive. And I think this is still very important. It, it is key that GenBank is a true archive of what is originally published. So we wrote the RFP. We got a, a bunch of proposals that came in, um, Intelligenetics, um, Los Alamos, Margaret Dayhoff and others. Um, I was also on the site visit committee that went to look at these places to, to judge the proposals. And in fact, my first um, look at Los Alamos, um, I thought it was a great place to make atomic bombs. I wasn't convinced it was a good place to house a database until I met Walter Goad. And I was very, very impressed with Walter. I'm sure everybody who ever met him thought that, that he was a really great guy, just a, a, a lovely guy, but so dedicated to the data. And he knew exactly what was needed. He'd already done a good job in putting together almost a prototype of GenBank. 
And so it ended up being the natural place, the best place to, to put it. And so GenBank got going at Los Alamos. From then on, I found myself asked to serve on advisory committees. I was on the advisory committee for GenBank for many years. I was on the international advisory committee. I always seem to get co-opted into these things. But I've got to say it's been a pleasure. I think GenBank has been such an important resource for the local community and for the world um, that without it, one could not imagine doing molecular biology these days. If you didn't have such a database, I think we would all be lost. You have to have this. And I think it points out, among other things, the importance of sharing data, sharing information. You know, as scientists, none of us can do it by ourselves. We all need the stuff that other people do. And very often, we don't necessarily need the stuff that the really brightest people are doing. Uh, perhaps it's the stuff who are just accumulating knowledge, gathering data, uh, putting it into a form where the rest of us can understand it. And ultimately, what makes science go forward is when someone has this leap of imagination and see a piece of data over here and a piece of data over here and realize they can be joined in some way and something new can come out of it. It's the essence of creativity. But you need to have these repositories of data. And it's absolutely crucial that they're available to everybody, that they're not just limited to those few people who have either assembled them themselves or, or can afford them. So I really got interested in the idea of data sharing long before all of this took place. And that came um, because of my work on Rebase. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about that. Okay, so Rebase is a database of information about restriction enzymes. My lab in the early 1970s um, was busy screening bacteria looking for new restriction enzymes. And in 1974, I attended a conference in Ghent, Belgium, and I took with me a, a little table that contained all the known restriction enzymes. There were about 25 or 30 at the time. And I showed it on a slide. Those were the days when we still had slides, no, no PowerPoints or anything. And it was an instant success. Everybody wanted a copy of it. They all thought this was great. Um, so I then went back to Cold Spring Harbor, made paper copies of it, sent it out to everybody at the meeting. And before long, I was getting more requests. People were saying, well, you know, I would like a copy of this too. Um, in fact, at one time, it was classified by the KGB in the Soviet Union. Uh, they thought somehow this, this was a, a great secret. And one of their investigators had actually come to this meeting in Ghent, took it back to the Soviet Union, and so it was being distributed there. Um, but it, it, it really made me think about how you're going to keep track of all of this sort of data. To start off with, we just had a regular typewriter, and so my secretary had to keep typing this thing, and we would add new things, and then she'd have to type it all over again. And then IBM came up with these wonderful memory typewriters. So it was real easy then just to add things, and, and it was not such a problem. And then eventually, um, it moved into something that looked much more like a, a database, first a hierarchical database. Um, then it went in Informics, actually, was the database we used. Then it went into a, a fully relational database and has been through many changes since then. But also, print became very important. In 1976, the Handbook of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology published what at the time was maybe a collection of about 60 or 80 strains and restriction enzymes that were present. And then it got published in Gene. In 1980, it was published in Nucleic Acids Research. And from 1980 onwards, it went on and has been published on a very regular basis. Of course, you can't print it anymore. It's, it's way too large for that. Um, but Publishing also had to change in order to allow databases to, to become useful, to become widely distributed, to let people know that they were there. Um, in 1984, Nucleic Acids Research publishes what became the first sequence supplement. And this was a, an issue of the journal that was devoted solely to sequence collections of one sort and another. There was a tRNA collection. Uh, there was a ribosomal RNA collection, there was rebase, there were some protein collections. Very few at that time, uh, but we kept that going for a number of years. And so that leads me on to nucleic acids research, um, the journal of which I'm now the chief US editor, and the longest serving editor. I've been an executive editor for that journal since the mid-1980s. 
And I really want to tell you a little bit about NAR because I think they've been incredibly important within this whole business of getting data out there and sharing it and making it available to people. So the sequence supplements ran between 1984 and 1992. During that time period, and I believe it was 1988 when we first implemented this, um, at an editorial meeting we decided that if GenBank was going to really gather all of the data, it was essential that the journals co cooperated in that, that it was no good just hoping that people would submit stuff. We've already seen, and with the PubMed, exper PubMed Central experiment, that you know, in general people don't submit stuff unless you insist upon it. <clears throat> and so we felt that the way in which, or I felt anyway, and a few other people that I spoke to felt similarly, that we really had to make sure that the journals would insist upon people first depositing their material into GenBank before they published. And in fact, we thought this had to be a requirement for publication. And NAR, JBC, I think both in, in this same year insisted upon this. There were a few other journals that were thinking about it, and pretty soon a number of them came on board. And we had a massive letter writing campaign, both from GenBank and also from people like myself as private citizens, going out telling the journals that we thought this was a really good idea. And it was not too long before everybody had pretty much signed on to this. And so, of course, we've reached the situation today where it's very, very difficult to publish in any sort of mainstream journal without first submitting your sequence to GenBank. If you do manage to get a, a piece in, then you can always um, get, really get a hold of the journal editors, and, and they will usually now insist in future that people have to do this. So it's become sort of the societal norm. If you want to publish a sequence, it's first got to go into GenBank, must be available at the time of publication, and then it's available to everybody. And I think this is such an important principle of data sharing, as Don mentioned previously, it really set the stage in many ways for data sharing, um, and it's absolutely crucial. The X-ray crystallographers took much longer to realize this, um, and, but now they've reached the same thing, that if you want to publish a structure, then it must be available in PDB um, at the time at which that structure gets published. And this is so important, there's nothing more irritating than to read a paper that has a piece of key data in it that you just can't get at, that all you can see is the description. You can't get in front of a computer and manipulate it. And so I think this was a, a really very important thing um, that NAR did. Uh, we were able to convince the, the people there this was a good thing. By 1993, um, we started something called the annual database issue. And this was... Um, really my initiative. Um, it replaced the sequence supplements. We realized that there were just a lot of databases out there and an awful lot of people didn't know about them. There was no formal route where you could publish many of these. Um, some of them were just sort of mentioned in other publications. We thought it'd be a good idea to have a, a, a database issue in which we focused on those biological databases that were out there. And in fact, the very first article to appear in that was a description of GenBank. There were a total of um, 24 databases went into the first issue. By 2008, there are 98 new databases came out this year. That is new databases, things that had not been described previously. 84 updates on things that had been described previously and more than a thousand databases in the compilation that we run. We um, also maintain online a compilation of databases. Um, Michael Galperin from NCBI has just become the editor for this. Prior to that, it was Alex Bateman. I did it for 11 years. In 2005, um, NAR also did something else that was novel, and that is we became the first journal to move from a subscription-based model to an open access model. And I can tell you it took a lot of convincing at o Oxford University Press um, to make them do this. Um, like every other publisher, they figured they were going to lose money, that they could not give the content away for, for free, that subscriptions would drop off, no one would pay the fees, and the journal would disappear. Um, I fought long and hard, eventually threatening to resign as chief editor if they didn't do it, and I think eventually that was what held the day for them, and so we, they decided, they agreed, that they would go open access. Um, the idea initially was that they would still allow or 
try to persuade libraries to um, take subscriptions to this journal. We would institute a small charge for authors uh, and that this would slowly increase as the number of subscriptions went down. Um, we've been doing this for several years now, two and a half years. Um, we are still profitable, the journal is still profitable. The number of subscriptions have gone way down, but we still have um, places that subscribe. We probably have reached almost the point where the, co the author costs will pay for the costs of producing the journal. And we're fortunate that Oxford University Press have always been a very forward-looking um, operation. Because they're a, a university press, they don't need to make massive profits. Um, they just like to make a profit sort of 5%, 10%, enough to invest in the future of publishing. And so for this reason, um, they are now also, um, they have open access models for a lot of other uh, journals. And a lot of journal, a lot of commercial publishers have been looking with great interest at what we've been doing. Uh, because I think there are many commercial publishers who realize that the old subscription-based models with massive profits uh, just isn't going to work into the future. That open access to the literature is just incredibly important. It's something we've got to do. Uh, I think it's absolutely inevitable it's going to happen. And for a whole variety of reasons, uh, I think it's one of the most important initiatives underway in science at the moment. We have to make this literature available. This is, this is where the collective wisdom of all of our forebears um, resides. You know, I think if you want to know what was happening in Drosophila genetics 50 years ago, it is very difficult to find it in the archives of the library. In fact, most students these days don't even know where the archives of the library are. But um, if it's available in digital form, if it can be searched, um, then it can be used by other people in exactly the way that we use um, GenBank. And I've been really very big on this for a long time. In 2001, um, I wrote uh, uh, an article, an editorial that went into PNAS about PubMed Central, which I call the GenBank of the published literature. Um, after that, there were letters in science. Um, I persuaded a bunch of my Nobel laureate friends to sign on. Um, we have been writing to all sorts of people. We've been making as much public noise and nuisance as possible, uh, particularly to the publishers, to encourage people to think really seriously about open access. And I think the, the essence of open access is that it's not just in the hands of sort of the senior people, either senior editors or, or senior authors, but it's also in the hands of everybody who writes a scientific article. Um, you can easily choose where you're going to publish. And I think this idea that you have to publish in science or nature or, or some of these fancy journals is an idea whose time is past that really, as always, it is the content of the work that's important, not where you publish it. Um, if you've done a good piece of science, you can publish it anywhere. People will find out about it, and they will respect you for it. And if it's in an open access journal, then everybody can read it. And I, I think one thing that's often ignored by many people in universities, where their universities are paying huge amounts of money in subscriptions um, for all the journals they read, is that for an awful lot of the world, uh, we have no access or very little access to the published literature. I work for a small company, and we can't afford to pay for access to all of the journals that I would like to read. It's just it's not possible. Um, increasingly, there are kids in high schools doing their science fair projects. They also would like to have access to the literature. Um, in general, they have no access. Um, schools can't even afford copies of Nature and Science, usually and the science budgets are going down and down and down, the library budgets are very minuscule. You go to many of the small colleges and universities that specialize in teaching in this country, and I'm constantly appalled at what poor access they have to the literature. And this isn't even to mention all of our colleagues who sit in third world countries, who sit in other countries, uh, where the cost of library subscriptions is just unaffordable. They can't do it. And I think we all know that if you want to work at the cutting edge of science, you've got to know where it is. And the only way you know where it is is by reading the literature. So I, I think this access, this idea that everybody should have access is key. And you know, NIH is supporting this research, or Howard Hughes is supporting the research, or the Wellcome, all of these funding agencies that are supporting the research, 
Why are you doing it if you don't want people to know about it? Why are you doing it if you want your authors to, um, to publish in subscription-only journals? Now, I, I'm unbelievably pleased that, that today is the first day uh, when the, the mandate for all NIH-funded authors to put it into a, a journal where the data will be available, where the text will be available within 12 months. This is terrific, but it's only a start. We need it today, okay? If somebody publishes, I want to read it today. I don't want to wait a year before I can read about this stuff. Um, so we're, we've started on this slope of getting things right, and I think it's only a matter of time before we get to the point where everything really is going to be right. Um, I think the universities in this country have a tremendous opportunity to do something really useful here. Um, the university administrations can really insist to their faculty about where they publish, how they publish, um, archiving their, on their own sites, making the stuff available on their own sites. But maybe we should be thinking about new publishing models too. The Public Library of Science has a model that's going. Maybe there are other models that will compete with the commercial publishers. Uh, these, I think, would be very good things. We need to be as innovative as we can in this particular regard. This was the, um, the PNAS article, which I, I got a huge amount of email back about this. I, I was very gratified. Now, I want to spend a little time talking about restriction enzymes and about some data and some work that we've been, done, been doing recently that depends critically on open access. I run this database of information about restriction enzymes. Um, it's got a, a lot of restriction enzymes. Just by way of background, I need to tell you one or two things. Restriction modification systems come in four types. Um, these are just the genes that are involved. The type ones, uh, three sub, well, they're, they're three gene enzymes. They're R2, M2, S. So it's um, five protein molecules that are present. Um, the type 2 enzymes, they come as a separate restriction enzyme, separate uh, modification enzyme gene. Type 3 have properties intermediate between these. And you, you don't really need to know much about this other than to know that the ones that are cold and come out of freezers are almost all type 2 enzymes. The people that everybody uses in their lab, these are the type 2 enzymes. But in fact, when you start to look in the genomes and so on, you realize there are hundreds of these others also. Now, the type 2 come in a variety of flavors, so there are many different genes. Just want to draw your attention to a couple of these genes. This C gene is a controlling gene that controls the expression of the restriction enzyme. Um, there's another one down here. Here's a V gene. This is a gene that is responsible for repairing the damage that is caused because HPA2 and many other enzymes use 5-methylcytosine in order to protect against the action of the restriction enzyme. And 5-methyl-C is mutagenic, and, and this helps to repair against the action. Um, if you have a, a gene that recognizes a symmetric sequence, you typically only need a single restriction enzyme gene, single methylase. If you have an asymmetric sequence, you need two methylases, one to methylate both strands. Now, we can look... Um, See if I can move this on. If we look and see what's going on in GenBank uh, and look at how um, things are getting into rebase, the first thing you see is everything that's solid here is solid because there is solid biochemical evidence that these things exist. So in this case, for the type 1 enzymes, there's a total of 92 um, restriction enzyme subunits, which we know on the basis of either biochemistry or genetics that these things exist. In the case of the type 2 enzymes, we have 3,753 known biochemically characterized enzymes. And the reason we have so many is these are the things that the biotechnologists use, the companies sell. These are the things that are good for molecular biology, and a lot of biochemistry has been done. Um, if we look in GenBank, on the other hand, um, the things that are stippled here, that are, are vega, these are things that are predicted. So we've got 1,480 restriction enzymes we can predict. Um, these are all pretty much on the basis of sequence similarity, except for a couple of examples, which I'll show you about in a moment. These are the corresponding methylase genes. They're a lot easier to find. Um, most of the genes that occur have not been characterized biochemically. Um, and these are all the ones you find in GenBank at the moment. Most of these in sequence genomes. 
For the type 3, it's even smaller. The contrast between the stuff where we know we have solid biochemical or genetic data, something experimental to know these things exist, very tiny fraction of the whole. These are the things that come out just from the sequence databases. The type 4 enzymes are, are sitting here. Very, very few of these have been characterized. Now, part of the reason for some of this is, is that the genes that form parts of these systems are very different from one, one another. And they actually uh, represent a very interesting set of genes that you find not just in these systems but throughout GenBank. And I think of them in terms of three categories. So we have things down here, um, the specificity subunits of the type 1 enzymes, and the controlling genes, the repair genes. These are very easy to find because they have common sequence motifs. They show a lot of similarity from one to another. Very hard to make a mistake um, when you're looking at a, a newly, piece, newly um, done piece of sequence. You can recognize these things very well. The M genes, the methylase genes, on the whole, you can detect these, but you can't do it with anything like the precision that you can do with these S, C, and V genes. And one of the reasons for this is that these genes are mosaic. That is, they are genes in which a part of the sequence varies a great deal, and a part of the sequence is identical. The bit of this, not identical, but very similar. The bit of the sequence that is very similar from one gene to another is the bit that is responsible for doing the chemistry of methylation, okay? Because the chemistry is the same in all of these cases. But the variable regions, these are the regions that recognize different DNA sequences, and these vary quite a lot, to a point where at the moment we're absolutely unable to predict what they're going to recognize unless they show tremendous similarity, uh, maybe better than 90% similarity to something where there's already good biochemical data. So they're much more tricky, uh, but nevertheless, they can be done. You can do these. Another interesting thing here is that many of these M genes um, are a little deceptive. A lot of them look as though they're DNA methyltransferase genes, but in fact, when they're tested, it turns out they're RNA methyltransferases, or in some cases, even protein methyltransferases, maybe even small molecule methyltransferases. And a part of the difficulty here in doing all of these um, annotations is that we don't have enough biochemical evidence. We just need desperately more and more biochemistry. And I think we really should step back and ask ourselves, you know, what is the point in doing so much massive sequencing that's going on at the moment if we're not going to invest similar resources in doing the biochemistry to figure out what these genes are doing? I think it's a huge problem. It's something which we need to address. And if anybody at NIH is listening, um, this is something that NIH needs to put some money into, and DOE and NSF and other places too, but there's a desperate need here to get some experiments done. Now, the R genes are the most interesting, and of course, these are the ones that as a company we're most interested in. The R genes fall into this category of genes that are evolving very rapidly. When you look in a typically newly sequenced genome, you find 10, 20, 25 percent of the genes look as though they're se sequence, they're species specific. That is, they're unique to that particular genome. The R genes fall into that category. Um, and for me, that's a particularly interesting category because this is the one where normally you have no clues to tell you how to do the biochemistry. But with the R genes, you have clues. And I think there are probably lessons we can learn from that that will be very valuable for us. So I'm going to tell you about one clue that depends upon the availability of data. So shotgun sequencing data, when you do um, a, a typical ABI-style shotgun sequence, you actually do an experiment. What you do is you take the whole genome DNA, cut it up into two to three KB fragments, clone them, do 500 base pair reads, usually from one, ideally from both ends. And so the question arises. What happens if one of these small fragments of DNA contains a gene that is lethal to the organism? And, of course, one example of such genes are the restriction enzyme genes. Okay? If I take just a restriction enzyme gene and put it into E. coli, and it makes a little bit of that restriction enzyme, 
the enzyme is going to cut up the E. coli genome because E. coli has no modification, has no way to protect it. And so what that tells you is that there should be gaps in the raw sequence data. Okay? And here's the example. So here's a restriction enzyme gene, here's a methylase gene. If we imagine these lines are just the starting 500 base pair reads of a 2KB clone, you can see that as long as you've got a clone that doesn't go all the way through the restriction enzyme gene, you'll be okay. But this one, which is likely the, the dash line, shows where the sequence should be, and the clone would extend on down here, you expect to find missing data. As soon as you get within the restriction enzyme gene, then of course you no longer make the full restriction enzyme, and so then you expect everything to be clonable again. And so the question was, um, I, I might say this was a bathroom moment that I had um, when it suddenly struck me that things should be this way. And so of course the next thing I did was to see if I could get my hands on some of the original data. Uh, I called up um, <coughs> Tiger, Claire Frazier. Um, she said, oh, I don't know if we still have the data around. We, we wanted to get some of the original data because we'd actually already knew what the biochemical answer was in some of these cases. She said, I don't really know um, whether we have it, but if we do, it'll be down in the basement. I'll send Stephen Salzberg down to go and find it. And fortunately, Stephen was, was helpful. He went down, he found the data, and so we imported the data, um, took a look at the sequence data for Haemophilus influenza. Um, Haemophilus influenza was the first genome ever to be sequenced. It was also the first source of restriction enzymes, and it, it should come as no surprise that um, Ham Smith was involved in both of those um, adventures. So we looked at Hindi 2. Here's the Hindi 2 restriction enzyme gene. Here's the methyl transferase. And what I've plotted here are just the start points of all the reads going from left to right. So, so this means that there is a read starting here which will run along here, uh, but it doesn't go all the way into the Hindi 2 gene. And what you see is here is a very nice gap um, upstream as predicted. And when you get here, um, then you start to see pretty much complete coverage. If you look on the other strand, you see um, going in the other direction this time, um, there is one clone sitting here um, that we would not have expected to be there. It turns out that this is an internal read from a fragment. That is, it's not the end of a clone, it's rather the internal read. And we know this because the, the data was annotated and we have both ends of that particular clone. So again, we have the gap that we predict. And we know, of course, that Hindi 2 is an active restriction enzyme. You put it into E. coli. Um, without the methylase, it, you can't do it. You can't get it in. So we also then went on and looked at Methanococcus yunashi, which was the first archaeal genome sequence, did the same kind of analysis, Helicobacter pylori, where we already cloned out all the genes. We knew what was active and what wasn't. And this turns out to be a very good indicator when you have an active restriction enzyme gene. And of course, there are many other genes that you can't clone into E. coli. In fact, there was a recent paper in Science by Sarek et al. Um, showing, doing an analysis of all of the things that were, were present. And in that case, you find there are many membrane proteins. There are certain highly expressed genes that can cause a problem. Um, but in this particular case, we're looking for things that are likely restriction enzyme genes. And based upon our experience, we know that they usually lie very close to methyltransferase genes. And so we have this second marker um, that tells us when we've got a gap that potentially is interesting. So of course, having done this, we wanted to look at a few unknowns. Um, we looked at several unknowns that we'd um, gotten. But we got this one also from Tiger. Um, uh, methylococcus species. Here is the brief analysis of the reads. This is the restrict, putative restriction enzyme gene here, the methyltransferase. Nice gap upstream, a nice gap downstream. We got some of the DNA, did an in vitro transcription translation system um, so that we could make just a little bit of the restriction enzyme in vitro. We didn't need to clone anything, just make a little bit of the protein in vitro, and then use that crude extract um, in lane one to digest some lambda DNA, and you can see you get the typical banding pattern that a restriction enzyme forms, a classic assay for a restriction enzyme. Um, in this case, we recognized the pattern. Um, it was the same as the one produced by BSSH2 that's shown up here, 
And if, in fact, you do a double digest between those two, then you see there's no change, which tells you they're both recognizing the same sequence. But there is absolutely no sequence similarity between these two. Um, just, I mean, it's just zero. And we know that BSSH2 recognizes GC, GC, GC and cuts here to leave a tetranucleotide extension. When we check the new enzyme, NCAT1, it leaves a two-nucleotide three-prime extension. Um, in part, that explains why there's no sequence similarity, but we have numerous cases where even when you've got two enzymes that recognize exactly the same sequence, they still show no sequence similarity. These things are really evolving very rapidly. So, so this was a nice demonstration that the method works and offers you uh, both a, a new use for shotgun sequence data and also a way of annotating some of these sequence-specific genes that otherwise would be quite difficult to get at. I just have a few final thoughts before I close. First thing is that open access to data and literature is really the great equalizer. Um, at the moment, um, we tend to think we're pretty equal, but in fact, we're not. Um, if you go to many of the universities and many of the colleges that are just not well, that well funded, they now at least have access to all the sequence data, but they don't have access to the literature yet. And I think this is something we, we really have to push for. Um, I know I had a secretary a few years ago who discovered that she had cancer. And the first thing that she wanted to do was to go and read about this. And before long, she was able to read the original literature um, about the particular kind of cancer that she had. It was ovarian cancer. She was able to read and understand what was going on in the primary literature. I think you would be surprised at how much the general public likes and can use access to the scientific literature if they have access. Now, at the time, I was at Cold Spring Harbor. She had access to the literature through Cold Spring Harbor. But if she'd been anywhere else, she would not have had access without paying. I recently spent $1,000 just browsing the literature for a topic I was interested, paying for access to journals that we didn't have a subscription to. Uh, it, this is outrageous. This is not the way that we should be disseminating our research. Oh, sorry. Now, open access, one of the things it does, it lets us know what we know. If, if you talk to many old-timers in C. elegans, in Drosophila, in zebrafish, in some of these old organisms, they'll tell you that people are doing experiments today that were done 20, 30, 40 years ago, okay? because they don't know that they were done. And they don't know they were done because they don't have access to the literature. And this is a, a really a terrible thing. And the nice thing about open access is that it does what we want all of our NIH research to do. It enables new discoveries. It enables people seamlessly to go from one place to another to make those connections, to ask questions, to have an idea and say, oh, let me just go and check that. If you have access to data and you have access to the literature, you can often do that easily and effectively. And as I said at the start, a 12-month delay in the literature just doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, you know, when I read a paper and I have an idea, I, I want to check the references there and then. I, I want to go and look at some of this other stuff there and then. I don't want to have to wait a year before I can go out and do this, and I don't want to have to pay an arm and a leg to do it today. And finally, I, I just want to make a point here that I think when I was a young investigator, when I got started, I didn't have tremendous trouble getting grants. And as a result of the fact that I could get my own money, I was able to do things that Jim Watson told me was simply ridiculous. I shouldn't be doing this, but I had my own money, and I discovered that he couldn't stop me, that I could do what I wanted to do. And, and a part of that, we discovered splicing. And a part of that, we discovered many of the restriction enzymes that are being used today. The nice thing about young people is they're scared of nothing. You know, They're foolish. They go to war. They go off to Iraq. How many of you in the audience would go to Iraq? We all know better. We know you go there, you're going to get killed. You go to war, you get killed. Young people, young scientists, these are the future of our profession. And we've set up this system in which we're rapidly making it almost impossible for young people to get grants. Even if they get a first grant, we make it very difficult for them to get a second grant. And why is that? Because we have a lot of old people, myself included, who have become very good at writing grants. 
You know, we, we know how to game the system. We know how to get the money out of the system. And when asked, we often say, oh, but we support lots of young people in our lab. But the point is, the young people that we support are typically doing our projects. They're not doing their projects. We don't let them go off and follow this crazy idea that may lead to the next big discovery. And I think it is absolutely essential that we find a way to change this system. Um, I would actually advocate a system in which we give the biggest grants to young people. The older you get, the smaller the grant you get. I think we absolutely should tie these things to age. And there are so many people who are old and established, doing good science, but they're not going to make the breakthroughs. Most of the people who get Nobel Prizes and other prizes and make big discoveries do it before they're 40. Okay? By the time you're 40, it becomes very difficult to then go on and, and make these creative breakthroughs and, and do the crazy experiments that lead to the big discoveries. And we've set up this system now in which we essentially saying to young people, well, you know, we'll wait until you're too old to be crazy enough to do this next nutty experiment uh, and, you know, then we'll start to fund you. Makes no sense. We've got to fund them when they're young. So, so that's my um, latest proselytizing thing. I, I see the sign there. Just want to acknowledge um, several places. I want to acknowledge NSF because they gave me my first grant. They supported research on restriction enzymes. They allowed me to get rebase going. And I always found them to be the most supportive of all of the granting agencies. I'm, I'm a big fan. Now, NIH gave me the most money. And NIH have really been very good to me over the years. Um, obviously, I got better as I got older at gaming the system. And so I was always able to, to produce money out of the system. But I am grateful NIH is a wonderful organization. Uh, but, you know, we're all getting a little old in the tooth, and maybe now is the time to hand over to the young people. NLM, I owe a continuing debt to. Um, they always invite me off onto interesting advisory committees and so on, but they also now provide the support for Rebase, and they've done that for about 12 years now, and I'm grateful for that. Oxford University Press, I will be forever in their debt, um, aside from the fact that I work for them and, and do a little editorial work. They have been the most responsive of all the publishers I've ever dealt with. Um, even though I had to, you know, threaten to resign to get them to do open access, they responded. You know, they, they did it, uh, and they've got it going, they got it started, and I think they're well underway to showing that you can move from being a subscription-based journal to being a an open access journal. And finally, of course, New England Biolabs, who pay my salary and give me lots of time to go and proselytize about things like this and, and come to events like this. And they've really been a wonderful company to work for. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you.